put you on top and that looks beautiful. Tell me when you're recording and I can. Yeah, just start. hit the record button. So anytime now. Beautiful. Well, Sakina did a lovely job of uh, welcoming me. And uh, I want to actually say that uh, it's a real privilege for me to be here today. I feel very fortunate, but also in, I felt in this sphere a couple of times over the last few years that I've come full circle. So, I mean, I was in this class. I loved this class quite a lot. Uh, I did all of my graduate work at OISE. In fact, my B.Ed., my M.Ed., and my Ph.D., and I really enjoyed this class because it was an opportunity to hear researchers they used to, I mean, I know it, we're online and so on right now, but the researchers used to come, you used to see them, they would present, and then you'd have some one-on-one uh, -on -one time. So I hope that uh, this presentation is um, you know, helpful for the course and that you have as, uh, as rich of an experience, I hope, that, as I did. Um, the title of my presentation is really meant to hit on a few areas that link to my research, both uh, prior or so on, but um, also currently, and then some uh, possibilities that I'm seeing in terms of future research. So it's not all about me, but um, I also remember presentations where the uh, presenter went beyond what they may have already published to kind of contemplate future research directions, especially in this context of this class. Just as a, uh, an FYI, my daughter's in the other room. I know I said that to most people who were here before. If she comes in, we'll roll with it, but uh, it'll be on camera forever, and that'll be great. <laughs> it's just part of the deal. Uh, so like it says in the title, if I can actually, there we go. Um, I'm going to do some introductions of me a little bit more detailed um, in regards to what Shakina said. And then we, as she mentioned and alluded to and teased, I like to do presentations, especially these types of presentations with some audience interaction and some audience involvement. So uh, Shakina has kindly helped me with creating some polls. So we're going to get a sense of who's in the room virtual room and then uh, there's other polls later on to get a sense of what your previous perceptions, understandings and experiences are with French as a second language education. Um, you'll see that it says histories of bilingualism. Uh, I just put that because it's not exclusive to FSL education, but I really feel important I really feel it's important to set the context, set the scene. Um, and you'll see why I think when we get to the possibilities part why that is so relevant. Then I'll talk about some realities relative to the research and then possibilities that I find both within my research and others for FSL education. I want to mention actually at the bottom of uh, each of my slides, you'll see two logos. They're somewhat slightly blurry, but um, one of them is for our research group at the University of Ottawa, Edic Lang. Um, if you want to go to that website and see what we're up to there, and there's always opportunities that we put on seminars, and Shakina actually presented at a seminar recently for our research group, which was lovely, and uh, we're really excited to network with other people interested in second language education. Similarly, on the right is uh, our second language education cohort, which is the cohort structure, or thematic structure anyway, for part of our teacher education program at the University of Ottawa, centered on uh, the kind of tagline that every teacher is a language teacher. So those training to be FSL teachers, as well as uh, quote unquote mainstream teachers of different subject matter are uh, implicated in the cohort. So it's a really great, uh, exciting endeavor that kind of merges this whole research practice domain. So, and I'm gonna try and slow down my talking, but I sometimes get ahead of myself. So me, oh, hello, somebody's coming. Oh, Rob Grant, oh, this is great. I think he's in Australia, sorry. <laughs> this is a co-host bonus. So what you see in front of you is a lovely picture of me in grade five with the arrow pointed at the bright blonde haired uh, little gaffer in the back. So I was actually in the very first French immersion, mid immersion, middle immersion, French immersion generally, but it was a middle immersion class in Brockville, Ontario. So that's about 45 minutes west of Ottawa, uh, 45 minutes to an hour. So that was quite an experience for me. So I'm coming at this topic and at basically my research and my work in general from the experience of having experienced it myself, the idea that you go into a classroom having some language background. For me, it was predominantly English. I came from an Anglophone household and French immersion was uh, something that was new. I actually really did not want to go to French immersion. I cried when my parents told me, and which is ironic because look at me now, but anyway. Um, <laughs> They, but I do remember distinctly, you know, the first day when the French teacher said a couple of, you know, security related fire alarm things, and then that was it. That was the last we heard her speak English. So I can remember that feeling of not having a clue what was going on. And then, of course, um, you know, having come full circle now, I, I understand that I have empathy for that particular feeling, but I understand, you know, the bonus and the benefits of drawing from the repertoires that we have as, as students and how beneficial that can be. 
Okay, apparently I can only do this with my mouth. So what you see there is actually my second uh, kindergarten class and I taught them French as a second language as well. So I moved from being a student to studying French all the way through high school and early university. I got my B.Ed. and then I decided to go and be an adult in the community and teach. And this particular experience, not only are those little gaffers like in their 20s now, I think or something like that, they're dead cute. But um, it definitely gave me a firsthand look into um, the life of a French teacher. I trained to be an IS teacher, in fact, at secondary, but in the elementary context, it was uh, quite different. And it, it sort of opened my eyes to that, those beginning stages of dual literacy skills happening in, in uh, more than at least one language uh, for some of the little, the little ones in that, in that picture. Then we moved to, uh, sorry, I won't actually move this. Can I, oh, I can't, there we go, that's better. Um, me as a bilingual teacher educator, you'll see, oh, see this one. okay, there we go. Um, basically, uh, I that picture on the left is at OIZ. I taught a few um, FSL teacher education courses, the first of which was at OIZ in, uh, I think, the, the year before I got the job at UOttawa. And on the right, I'm extraordinarily pregnant. But these particular uh, pictures are very dear to me because they're, uh, it really is that first full circle of, of speaking to future teachers and getting a sense of their experiences as learners and their experiences as um, you know, teachers of, of all kinds of different subjects, not the least of which was French. So um, diving head first into that and given the, the sort of experience I've had is, has been really helpful. I think my email is on. Oh my God, hold on a minute. Okay, I'm just gonna keep going. Um, Basically then now I've become a parent. So my daughter is on the screen there, she's in the other room, but I've found it even more intriguing this human element of what we do as researchers when our different perspectives come into play. And I'm watching her dive into learning French in her experience and watching what can happen at home and what can happen at school. So again, all of these different things are coming into play uh, and really I, I think are coming, I'm wanting to come into play from me as a researcher as well. So let's do the polling. I think Shakina has a couple of polls to start off with, just so I can get a sense of who's in the room uh, and relative to your own experiences yourself. So I'm gonna let, do I have to stop sharing? Is that what I do? Uh, yeah. Actually, I think it will launch the oh, poll even, yeah, yeah, so you don't have to stop sharing. <laughs> okay, I wanna actually just get out of this to turn my, oh, for goodness sakes, I wanna turn my email off. Can I do that? Oh, there we go, that's better. Sorry, you're gonna get a you're gonna get a look at my email right now. <laughs> no worries, everyone's probably busy filling out the poll now. Yeah. Okay, that's awesome. Uh, okay, so I need to start new share. Uh, so I don't see the poll anymore. Is that normal? Um, you should be able to see it too, but I can. I guess share the results as soon as okay I see that okay, everyone's yeah. voted now so let me share the results and there we go okay do you, do so, you see it yeah I do okay, I do great. so clearly I expected to see graduate students but it's really interesting to see that a good proportion almost half, well 27 percent are K-12 classroom teachers post-secondary instructors we've got some stakeholders in the room stakeholders I can mean you know consultants anybody who is implicated in some way to perform and three professors. So it's lovely to see. I love the graduate students here too. So I think our that's very helpful to know. Our next question is related to learning uh, French as a second language to give me a sense. It's a very quick yes or no. Just a few more responses coming in. We'll share the results shortly. I can I can actually see, you them see as it. they come in. Yeah, <laughs> that I can see. Is that part of the Coco feature that I get to enjoy? Yes. You get oh, okay. special okay. privilege. There you go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Looks like so far the majority have learned French in the mm -hmm. All right, maybe I'll go ahead and share the results. Yeah, yeah. So that's 61%, 39% no. So I am intrigued to know uh, later on when we start discussing if any of your questions, perhaps you'll feel free to tell me about uh, how your experience learning French in the system in Canada has influenced whatever uh, questions you may have. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, and the last one I think for right now. Now this might be less because there's only a few teachers I remember. That makes sense. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, that's so. Again, not as many as students, but we have a nice, a nice, uh, a nice sort of balance. And again, those of you who may be teachers who were learners as well, that also creates a, an interesting dynamic. Okay, thank you for sharing that. It gives me a good sense of who is in the virtual room and uh, where you. Just a brief snapshot of uh, your experience relative to. Uh, the content I'm about to talk to you about. So I pressed close. Can I just go ahead? Are we good? Yeah, yeah. we're good. Yeah, okay. Oh, of course, there goes that. Okay, let's try that again. So the history of bilingualism in Canada. So this may appear a little bit dry, but I think it's always, it was, it's always, it was a very good brush up for me to when I created these slides to get a sense of where we are at policy wise, where we've come, how far we've come policy wise and uh, how this links to education. So the first thing I wanted to say was just as a personal anecdote, having, I'm, I haven't traveled a whole lot, but when I do travel abroad, when I tell people I'm Canadian, and in fact, even if I speak French, the usual response I get in terms of the, the response relative to Canada, French, English, is that, you know, so much stuff be so lovely to live in a bilingual country, you're bilingual, you're the quintessential Canadian, this is wonderful. And I've reflected on that a lot because my typical response is, you know, yes, there's the French and English, but I wouldn't say every Canadian per se is bilingual. So I almost like to start this discussion of the histories and the realities and the possibilities with, uh, I don't like to burst the bubble of people who have an impression of Canada, but I think it's useful to look at data. And this is of course now 10 years old and I haven't got a chance to get my hands on an updated map, but this is in fact a 2011 census data uh, in response to the question or the uh, asking about uh, whether you have knowledge of French and English. So what you're seeing is the percentage of population reporting having knowledge of French and English. And one might expect if Canada was bilingual to see a lot of purple all over the country. And what we see actually is not only smatterings, but particular condensate, like condensed parts. So it's not surprising that it's darker purple at the Quebec Ontario border in the um, officially bilingual province of New Brunswick and smatterings across uh, different regions of the country. For example, um, in Western Canada, where there are many um, Francophone communities and uh, in Eastern Canada as well. Um, but it just goes to show that, you know, what I've had in terms of government um, colleagues, colleagues who work in government and so on, when I've talked to them about this, they, they're very clear that in fact, you know, no, 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 Canada is not necessarily bilingual, although we would love to be, but Canada has two official languages. That's, that's where we stand. So when we talk about Canada and language policy related to French and English, that's kind of where we are. So to me, this begs the question, okay, well, what's the policy? What's the reality? How does this work in terms of schools? So it's worth going back to the 1960s to think about the quiet revolution. So it was significant in that it brought the issue of French culture and language politics to the forefront of uh, Canadian politics generally. Political elites uh, and the Canadian public were faced with questions of how to deal with the cultural and language aspirations of French speaking speakers in Quebec. And for those supporting a Canadian Federation with Quebec, the issue centered on how best to accommodate the linguistic and cultural group with the United Canada. So really the Quiet Revolution kickstarted this creation of several strategies and policies centering on bilingualism. So you see many of them listed below. I'll go through some of them quickly. The Royal Commission on Bilingualism and Biculturalism in the early 60s um, helped to frame language politics and government action in terms of equality, common community, both linguistic groups were to be recognized as having equal status in Canada, and that was a pretty big deal, uh, and is still a pretty big deal. Um, moreover, English and French Canadians were not to be separated into separate linguistic communities, and instead both languages were to be promoted across Canada in an attempt to create a step, uh, single bilingual community. And as you saw from the census data, that's perhaps not necessarily the reality, but that's the uh, motivation behind the policy. So since the Royal Commission on Bilingualism and Biculturalism, the federal government has pursued a language policy characterized by equality, 
um, between French and English and the vision of this common bilingual country. So we have the Official Languages Act, which was revised in 1988, um, but was created in 1969. And it's a federal policy that, a federal act that declared French and English to be official languages of Canada while requiring all federal institutions, governments, um, departments, agencies, crown corporations to provide their services in French or English at the customer's choice. So it's not just provision, it's, it's to be able to respond to the linguistic preference of the uh, customer client. Provincially, um, under these policies has been the belief that Quebec is in fact at the heartland, the heartland kind of thing of the French language in Canada and that it is the responsibility of the government of Quebec to promote a unique French society within the province. So you see a few um, policies there linked specifically to Quebec that speak to such things as uh, advertising primarily in French, um, acquiring a certificate of francisation, which could only be obtained when the business proves to the government that it could function in French and then address its employees and its clients in French. Um, in 1977, the Charter of the French Language came to be, and it was passed by the Parti Québécois, which declared French to be the only language allowed on commercial signs in the province, with some limited exceptions. And it also required children of new immigrants who went to public school um, in Quebec that they study in French until the post-secondary level. So there were starting to be infiltrations into bilingual education that are important to note. Similarly, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms is a super important one to note that it constitutionally enshrines several key language rights, such as English and French as official languages of Canada and then by, of New Brunswick, the only bilingual province in, officially bilingual province um, in, sorry, the only province with two official languages, there we go, <laughs> in Canada. Uh, moreover, um, both languages have equality of status and equal rights and privileges as to their use in government institutions. And then of course, um, some sections that outline particular language rights and government institutions, such as the right to use either French or, language or English in any proceeding in the Canadian Parliament, the right to use either language in any court established by Parliament and the general public to communicate and receive services in either language. So what does this translate into in terms of education for many of you who are familiar, I guess most of you in terms of learners are, um, but it's important to note that um, how this sort of came to be. So in 1970, the federal government launched the official languages in education program. So this is again, when it comes to federal, provincial um, governments run or determine and decide related to education, but they receive funding from the federal government alongside policies that sort of guide where that funding should go. So in 1970, this um, program came to be and it provided provinces and territories with funding for second language instruction and minority language instruction in both official languages. In 1982, the, Charter, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, as I mentioned before, uh, dictated that provincial governments offer education to Canada Canadians in the official language of their choosing, um, even when only a minority speaks that language. So for example, in English dominant areas, French speaking minority um, speakers have the right to educate their children in French and vice versa in uh, English, um, sorry, in French dominated areas. So in, what does this translate to in terms of programs? This may be where you might see some familiarity. So um, in terms of the English as an official language programs, if that's a language that you're learning, it's not your language of schooling, so you're learning it as a, a supplemental language as it were. Um, there's what I'm saying here, core programs. So I mean, I'm using those, some other provinces use basic, um, there's other terminology, but they've come to kind of be understood as, as the baseline, as almost the default. Um, many times if it's in elementary, it's uh, French or in this case, English, um, official language education a few minutes a day. Um, and it's learning about the culture, learning uh, the language as a language course. Contrasted with immersion, um, which is uh, not only a language course, but then in addition to at least two subject level uh, classes done in the official language. So in terms of if I shift to French immersion, at least two subject matter courses would be taught in French alongside a um, French language course. Now, of course, French immersion differs on many levels, not only in terms of entry point, entry grade, but also in terms of um, the intensity. So in some boards, you might have early immersion starting in grade one um, at 100%, whereas in another board, it might start earlier in kindergarten, but be at 50-50. So it really depends on a few things, not necessarily not including things like parental demand. It could depend on resources, whether there's teachers to teach those courses. And then of course, um, just general uh, interest in the community and, and buy-in if you will. And then English language schooling, French language schooling for the um, uh, minority uh, population. So when we see that that's how it's, the policy is sort of translated into uh, practice, 
what are the realities? And when I say realities, I'm referring to, um, I'm going to talk about today anyway, the two most popular French second language education program formats, which are French immersion and core French. And it's worth mentioning right now that contrary to what some people might misperceive, at the moment, the enrollment trends show that only under 12%, so I think it's close to slightly over 11%, of Canadian students eligible to study French as a second language do so through a French immersion program. So, um, whereas that means the remaining, what are we talking, over 80% are learning it through a core French program or perhaps extended French at a lower um, percentage and then uh, as well, um, uh, intensive French, which I can speak to later if there's questions about that, but I'm gonna focus on French immersion and core French. So what are the realities? So this is sort of a, uh, oh, wait a minute, where did I go there? Oh, right. This is my, right. I forgot. I inserted the full question, didn't I? So before I get to what the research says, I wanted to get your sense, again, regardless of whether you have experience learning in FSL, which many of you seem to do, teaching, what are your impressions of the effectiveness of FSL education in Canada? This doesn't have to be a long drawn out response. It's just give me your knee jerk, um, or if you're, in, if you're in this class and you read the articles, what are your, what are your impressions at this moment in time? It'll give me a good sense of a kind of a pre-activity um, take. So think about your, your impressions, not just what you know of the research, but your. Stephanie, do you want them to Good give their responses on uh, Menti, or just in the chat box, yeah. or just out loud? No, yeah. like, do, whatever, whatever works for you. You are amazing that you're, like I said, <laughs> My brain is like not on. Not on not I'll be your brain for now. So I put in, uh, so if you can all go to menti.com and the code is in the chat box at 641-6045. Okay, um, just one second. Think about your responses and I'll, um, it says it's not open for voting. Okay, just give me a second. Think of your responses first and then I'll, I'll just change the settings. You can just give it so. in the chat if that's easier. No, don't yeah. look. No, look. No, look. Okay, there we go. Oh my God. I can't seem to get like my computer to just, there we go. That's it. I don't even think I can. You You'll should be able to. Do I have to go to the site to read them? I guess I do, right? I uh, know, I'll, I'll, I'll share my screen so that you oh, can okay. see it right now. Do you yeah. want me to stop? Is it okay, open, is it open yeah. for voting now? It looks, it looks like it's your screen is turning to share. Awesome. Not yet. It is. Okay, maybe maybe you could um maybe everyone could just put their responses in the chat box for now that i'm not sure why this let's particular one's not okay. working but just to for the sake of time maybe let's just do the chat box for now awesome chat box works that i can see so i'll wait to share my screen until after this is perfect awesome Oh, now I can't see the chat anymore. Oh wait, that's me. I just have to do that. Okay, there we go. Okay, so I'm reading. These are all really. Oh, so I think we got both going on now. <laughs> yeah, the mentee decided to work now. <laughs> so, so some of you haven't put your responses, and you could switch to the mentee. But we also have responses in the chat box. Do you see those, Stephanie? Do you want me to read out? I'm look, I'm in the chat. I'm uh, I'm going okay. to town here in the chat, so I can see. So I can see both actually, but mm -hmm. I'm trying to focus. Yeah. Yeah, I can see a lot of, you'll, you'll see a lot of your perspectives represented in what I'm going to present in terms of research. And I, um, part of it is, is sad that we're still experiencing these kinds of things. Some of the issues that I'll talk about are, are what I term or what has been termed, I guess, pervasive or chronic. And it just seems like we're in this revolving um, door relative to it. But um, I see a lot of differentiation between core French and French immersion, which is very interesting to see. 
um, related to language proficiency. Okay. I see this idea as an add-on. I think that was Robert or hi Rob. <laughs> I love that you're here. Um, yeah. And I see a lot of, I see some, one person said really mixed experience as a parent, lots of bilingual bio. So there's that, that perspective that you get as a, as a parent versus um, um, as a student, if some of you were students yourself. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Hannah is also sharing from BC. I didn't get a sense of, I'm so silly. I should have asked a full question related to where people were. That would have been helpful. Um, interesting, okay. So I encourage you to keep what you posted in the chat or in the uh, mentee in your head to see how it compares to, and it's not to say the research is by no means the truth, but um, it's interesting to see how the research represents or sort of meets or is divergent from your experience yourself, which kind of brings me back to what you'll see at the end, that I um, really think that the voices of people living French second language education right now are worthy of um, being emphasized a lot more, let's say, in the research. So should I share my screen, screen again, Shakina? Oh, are you? Yeah, go for it. Let's try this God, this is like a technological ballet. Where am I? Okay. So share. I almost left the meeting by mistake. Okay. <laughs> so French immersion. Strengths, challenges, and realities, and then I'll do the same thing for core French quickly. So in fact, um, a lot of the research evidence points to linguistic, academic, cognitive benefits of French immersion in particular. Um, linguistically, some of you spoke about differences between core French and French immersion in terms of linguistic proficiency. And in fact, research, and so you only have a few studies on the bottom, but these are, these are kind of key ones that speak to some of the pivotal uh, findings that we've encountered in the last, um, you know, since I guess the 60s and 70s when uh, French immersion came to be. But um, French immersion students have been known to uh, demonstrate high proficiency, not only in French, but in uh, English as well, which responds to a common myth or fear of parents in particular, I would say, um, that I've encountered, that their English would be compromised if they're not learning subject matter through English. Um, and they're not learning how to read in English, for example. And of course, um, studies have shown that once English is introduced after an intense period of French, that French immersion students are able to catch up quite quickly. Um, and in fact, in some cases related to uh, Turnbull, Hart and Lapkin's findings can outperform those um, on tests for example, standardized tests in Ontario conducted in English, even though they've learned all the content in French that they have done as well, if not better than their English counterparts. Which again, there's other factors that they acknowledge could come into play, but that's an important uh, finding related to what I've talked to in the second bullet, that evidence of transfer. This idea that even though we are, someone spoke about monolingual uh, principles and monolingual ideals in French immersion, that French immersion only happens in French and that learning only happens in French. And of course, we can see from the research that there is evidence of transfer between uh, both languages and other home languages as well. Um, some research, recent research has shown. Academically, of course, that transfer of knowledge is not only linguistic, but it can be uh, academic knowledge related to different subject matters. Um, cognitive, uh, certainly there are studies, I'm thinking of Ellen Bialystok's work and uh, on the cognitive, uh, bra the brains of bilinguals and multilinguals. And certainly there's um, cognitive flexibility, problem solving, creative thinking uh, benefits from learning a, an additional language. If we look at challenges, the immersion ease one is, is one that I always find interesting that Roy Lister coined in the 80s when doing an analysis of, I think it was particularly the oral language of uh, French immersion students. So talking about that they're not quite, and this is again, I would contest not exactly, not, not research that I, not necessarily support, but the whole native speaker ideal, the native speaker as the goal of uh, additional language education is what this is based on. So the immersion ease is that kind of language, this particularity of French that is spoken by graduates or people, students in French immersion, that's not quite native-like, but is still better than uh, basic per se, particularly in terms of um, fluency and vocab breadth of vocabulary of French immersion students, but the immersion ease can come in more related to grammatical um, challenges and also on the season. Form-focused instruction has been a challenge that's been documented for a lot of years. Roy Lister's work, again, has responded very well to that with a counterbalanced approach. Teachers say that they struggle to integrate language into their content-based teaching, which is basically what the form-focused instruction challenge uh, is referring to. And uh, there's been a lot of work in that, in that domain that's super interesting to look at 
Uh, and it's very important because that's a criticism, I guess, of, of immersion that students may come out not with the level of accuracy that they should um, because they haven't had a chance to really dive into the language. Student motivation is one you'll see, um, for those of you who read the articles that I uh, assigned for the class today, it's something that presents itself in French immersion as well and in core French, which is a challenge. Um, French becomes not only you know, less interesting for various reasons, there are also scheduling conflicts when we get to secondary. Some students need to take other courses and French just doesn't line up, particularly immersion courses. So they just, uh, the attrition level presents itself mostly at that level. I contrast challenges and realities just to make sure that the teacher voice is there and that um, voices of other stakeholders are there um, in addition to students and, and uh, parents and administrators. And for years, uh, French immersion teachers have talked about the reality that they are they feel like translators when they are teaching their courses for the longest time. And I would, I would hazard a guess that even now, it's tough for them to find resources that are particular to their grade level and particular to students who are learning French as an additional language. So one might say, oh, you can just take from resources that are used in a French language school system. Well, that proves quite difficult and challenging um, in terms of uh, the language level. So you'd have to differentiate that. And then the alternative is translating uh, particular resources that meet the language level and are maybe used in the English side of the content, but of course there's, there's no French there. The shortage of French immersion teachers and exclusive practices are definitely related, I feel, because not only has there been um, evidence shown in the research that inclusion and differentiated instruction can work quite effectively in French immersion, and that has led many to say that French immersion should be open to everybody, so this uh, tagline of immersion for all, and that has basically led to a lot of boards offering immersion more widely and hasn't led to the shortage of French immersion teachers, but has led to a super increase in demand um, for French immersion teachers in particular. Uh, most encouraging about the inclusive practices is the reality that this tendency to um, uh, exclude students from French immersion if they demonstrate exceptionalities, as somebody put in the chat, this idea that if you are a, a child, your child has special needs that you're not meant for immersion. And of course that has contributed for years to that elitism with French immersion. Now um, I've spoken to many parents and uh, teachers even now, and it's, it's starting to, that's starting to stop. So, which is really great from a belief standpoint, certainly. Um, but the practice itself is, is still kind of an option. But uh, obviously I would advocate that that is the decision of the parents in um, collaboration with the school. So if we contrast that a bit with uh, core French, we see strengths in terms of evidence of transfer. Um, again, this idea that if you, if the core French teacher is able to collaborate with the English language teachers, both thematically and in terms of vocabulary and so on, there can be great uh, strides made in terms of uh, French proficiency. Um, of course, the, um, the contention in the core French standpoint or side of things, and um, myself and Callie Mady investigated this is the the uh, characterization of, the, of a core French teacher of a core French program is something that promotes literacy. This idea that literacy can be in that transfer that happens can be helpful to collaborate with the core French teacher and have those two um, teachers of English and teachers of French collaborate more, uh, more efficiently, I guess, or more um, could happen. Um, is something that in the core French literature related to transfer and literacy is still kind of pervasive. Um, in the Canadian Parents for French, article that I was um, able to really dive into on a critical standpoint out came from a lot of the core French research since the year 2000 is, is this interesting finding of instru instru instructional experimentation in core French. So such things as uh, the AIM program, of course, started in core French, there's arts-based instruction that has um, taken off in, in the core French context. Um, and of course, instructional experimentation could also relate to uh, reworking the intensity and the distribution of time in uh, in core French. So certainly, and it's in the in the CPS article, compact core French is something that could I believe uh, should be explored more widely and more intently, both in terms of research and practice. But um, it seems to be one that's met with resistance. So we'll talk about that in the realities in a second. In a second, challenges, low levels of proficiency. Now, one might expect. Um, that with less time in French, that we would have lower levels of proficiency. But as somebody alluded to in the chat, there is something about the pedagogy of core French that doesn't necessarily encourage oral proficiency. Um, a lot of the, um, or taking risks, I guess you could say, um, from a history perspective of the research on um, what students are doing, if they're speaking, who's doing the talking. Um, I think it would be worth also mentioning that 
um, a lot of the research on core French observational research shows that um, in many cases, the core French program happens in English, that there's not a lot of French spoken on the part of the students or the teacher. Um, layer on top of that working conditions of the undervaluing, the marginalization of core French in the school, the teacher who has a cart, who's walking around without even their own space to teach in French commonly. Um, so it's, it's really given a, a sub standard um, kind of valuing in the, in the grand scheme of the school. Um, and that refers to, I guess I'm fluctuating between the challenges and realities now, what I talked about with um, Sharon in that article, the institutionalization of core French, that it's kind of an anchored prep time for mainstream teachers that uh, some systems do not want to take away, they don't want to mess with. Um, that seems to be a very easy scheduling thing. So it's, it's become kind of the way it's done. And that going back to the experimentation when it comes to compact core French, there's pushback when it comes to that. Um, the shortage of core French teachers in my mind, oh, sorry, I'll talk about student motivation first. Um, attrition in core French is very common. It's been chronic, particularly at the time in um, most provinces, uh, Ontario I'm most familiar with, of course, where it's no longer a mandatory subject of study. It's mandatory from grades four to eight, um, at the very least core French, but French in general. And then in high school, there's usually one credit. And it's at that point after they take the credit that the motivation just dips off and they're, they're out of there, they're done. Um, so that's something that stakeholders are trying to respond to, teachers are responding to. Um, and so this um, is, is definitely a pervasive issue. One reality I wanna mention before moving on is the resistance to change. I think there's, um, even though it still boggles my mind, even though it's over 80% of students are learning FSL through this program, there still is a resistance to changing in order to improve the fact that that's the go-to kind of program structure, but we wanna do innovation, we wanna make it happen. Teachers are making it happen. Core French teachers are making it happen. They are doing an extraordinary job even in the working conditions they're in, but the resistance to that system level change is definitely uh, prevalent. And I'd be interested to know if uh, other people share that perspective or if I'm on my own. Um, so one could um, think, or really, I guess I was trying to, to contemplate when thinking, okay, what do, I, what do I do with this? This is a pervasive chronic problem. And I wanted to get into more detail about what the research has to say on um, looking beyond, I guess, sorry, the research findings, so the reality of what researchers are prioritizing, because I can see the power of research in making change, if there's resistance to this kind of change, and now I'm kind of segueing to FSL generally, but particularly core French, which is a huge passion of mine. Um, and I want to be able to validate the experiences of those teachers, those students, and, and make it as great a program as it can be. Um, and so I wanted to see what the research had to focus on. So that really led to the impetus for the, um, the article that you read for class uh, that looks at <clears throat> um, our interest in looking at, okay, since the year 2000, what is the research focused on? What issues are top of mind in terms of research? What are they choosing? Not only what are they choosing to research, but what has come to the fray in terms of um, aspects of FSL education that are being focused on? So even though programmatically we're going around in circles and I felt like we're going through that sort of revolving door that I alluded to earlier, is that the same in terms of research? So I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. And those of you who've read the article have a sense of what I might say. But um, just to know that myself, Mimi Masson, who's at the University of Ottawa now, and Sharon Lapkin, who's a professor emerita at uh, OISE, um, were really intrigued in looking at, um, and we collected um, 180 some odd articles, I think from 2000 to 2017, empirical articles uh, published in peer reviewed journals, um, focusing on Canadian K-12 FSL education. They didn't have to be Canadian journals, obviously. They could, they could be published anywhere, but that had to be the focus. And that made up our database of articles to run some interesting um, analyses, I guess, on. But the first point was, what issues are top of mind? And then we wanted to look at who is being researched. This article was actually just accepted. It's impressive with the Canadian Modern Language Review to get a sense of what, again, this idea of researcher decision-making around FSL. What has piqued people's interest? And, uh, and so we wanted to get into that. And I wanted to briefly do a little plug for the Canadian Association of Applied Linguistics. We've housed that database um, on their website. Um, so those of you who aren't members should become members. I'm doing a plug because there's a great graduate student community there for sure. Um, but what you get access to in terms of that database is everything that's there right now, but you don't get the, I think the full and vivo file to mess around with unless you become a member. So it's worth going to take a peek at that. It's in, I think the tab is members and then it'll say database somewhere. So it's worth, uh, it's worth going to take a peek at that if you're looking for particular articles and how we coded them in vivo 
with uh, the different keywords and so on, you have access to that. So you can do a search yourself of the um, post-millennial research. Um, so what did we find in terms of that issues that are top of mind? This is a super blurry slide, <laughs> but the graph is in the, is in the, uh, is in the article. But what I always find fascinating when I looked at this, because I can remember the distinct moment when uh, Mimi put that up on the screen with Sharon and I, and I was like, oh my gosh, this looks so cool. So you can see that French language form is in red, French language instruction is in green. So those are kind of ones that have, you know, stood the test of time. There's definitely years in which there were more published articles. And those of you who've published articles know that just because you it came out in 2009 doesn't mean it was researched in 2009. It was likely submitted at least a year prior because that's how long it takes. But it's still interesting to see from a, a focus standpoint. Um, they're fairly consistent. What's interesting is student backgrounds. So this idea of what, what students come into FSL programs with and how that impacts different aspects of their learning, their motivation, their experiences, et cetera. That really came to being, it appears in 2006, I think, and that's the purple one. A little bit before then, but it was, if I remember those studies, they were kind of looking at it as a confounding factor. So something that might interfere with uh, success in an FSL program, whereas as you see it burgeoning and going up, it's uh, looked at as, as, as a more integral factor, something that actually can not just not impeding, it's actually making it uh, much more rich. And then we have a boom in literacy. So literacy is the blue, and that boom is really happening in uh, since 2008. And that comes back, as you'll see in a second, actually, I'll just put it over here, another blurry table, but is uh, in the article, that if we look at um, what's circled there on the screen, that French immersion, that is the main kind of crux, that's the main focus of the post-millennial research in French immersion, is on the literacy. So not just literacy skills in French, but actually a lot about bioliteracy. <coughs> phonemic awareness, multiliteracies, and so on. So what I want to note from this particular kind of isolation of core French and French immersion is not only the different, you know, okay, in, in core French, we can see that a lot of the research is looking at French language instruction, not so much in French immersion, it's literacy, but also just the sheer number. 66% um, in fact of the entire database is focused on French immersion, even though, as I said prior, it's the program that caters to only about 11, 12% of the population. So to me, there's something off about that. Um, so it led uh, me to, and my team and my colleagues to wanna say that um, it doesn't tell us much about what's happening in FSL programs other than immersion. That was my first thought. And you'll see too that the, the academics I admired the most are the ones that sort of are real about their thinking at the time. And I felt very strongly about this. I was like, you know, there needs to be more research in core French and so on. And then when I was, it's, it's the same, year of publication, but as I said, it was worked on prior. But then I started to think about it with Nini and we started to say, well, you know, okay, why do they have to be separate bodies of research? Why can't there be, why can't they speak to each other? Why don't they speak to each other? And I think that's a question we can discuss later if you want. But in that um, CPF article, we spoke about that a little bit more and talked about and, sh and hopefully highlighted in an effective way, the ways that the two bodies of research can speak to each other and ways in which they overlap. Meaning that, um, while they're going beyond this call, like we wanted to in the other article for more research in core French, that in fact, um, going beyond that to showcase the potential impact of renewed core French research emphasis for all FSL programs. So that research in French immersion can benefit core French and that research in core French can benefit immersion. One might not look that way in the second vein of things, but, um, or even in the first, but that there is potential for them to speak to each other. An additional area that I felt strongly in terms of that shift in my thinking uh, where research on both domains can speak to each other was related to student motivation. Now I linked earlier to student motivation being prevalent in core French for different reasons, um, but also it's prevalent in French immersion. So I think that there's uh, an area to research there, but I wanted to look particularly at core French students and their motivation. So this is where I want to focus the discussion of possibilities selfishly, but I wanna get your feedback. I wanna hear what you have to say. And uh, I think it was a piece that came up in the chat quite a lot. And I think it really speaks to most, if not all of the comments in the chat, in the chat about this idea of effectiveness that the student is at the core um, and their, um, their motivation to want to continue to learn whether it's mandatory or um, optional is definitely uh, something worth investigating. So just to give a general lay of the land, I've already mentioned the trend of attrition, but the core French uh, trend is most alarming. Now, this is a, um, a stat that I refer to continually that 3% of grade nine students who come in and all take core French or all take some level of FSL, 3% of them continue to grade 12. 
And that's a stat that's from about, I think, 2010. A lot of people think like, wow, okay, what's, you know, what's happening here? And I've given you some examples of factors. Um, but I think one initiative that I want to mention right now that I find that's really intriguing, and I don't know to what extent there's a lot of research on it right now, is um, there's a lot of DELF testing happening at the latter years of uh, secondary school. For those of you who might not be familiar, that's the test for French um, language ability that's linked to the CEFR. Diplôme d'études en langue française, je crois, quelque chose comme ça. And that is being offered as kind of like a carrot, meaning that if you take French all the way through to grade 12, you'll get to present for a, the DELF level of your choosing, and then you will exit with some kind of qualification. And it also gives the school board a sense of your level of proficiency. So it's, I don't, I see that as super interesting, encouraging research from perhaps even to see the impact on the motivation would be something I would want to study. Generally speaking, this kind of situation is called for more studies. And while some have been um, conducted in intensive French, and French immersion contexts, the core French contexts are fairly retrospective in nature. So looking at after they've decided to continue or discontinue, why did they do so and so on. Um, whereas I wanted to kind of look at it in, as in the moment as possible to get a sense when they've made that decision, when they're in the process of making that decision, hence why for the study I'm about to, we're about to look at together, the data, um, it was really from that grade nine level, like right when they're about to make that decision of whether to continue or not for grade 10 when it's no longer motivating or not, not motivating, no longer mandatory, excuse me. So first off, we're gonna shift again, a few extra polls to get your, or, well, we've already shared our beliefs and experiences, I guess, related to that, if I'm right, I don't know where my polling questionnaire is. Ah, yes, so I guess it's um, beliefs in a way. Then we're gonna co-analyze a few uh, data sets that I think some were in the article, some may not have been. So Kina, I'm gonna get your help with uh, one doing it a la Antoinette mm -hmm. in a second, not yet, I'll tell you in a minute. Mm -hmm. And then uh, to me, I wanna end with critically discussing the so what. So not only in the context of this particular body of research, but also in the larger scale realities that we just talked about, and then in the larger scale of the uh, bilingual policy. So hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about that. So here we go and share. So is this, are we able to go to Menti or what would you prefer for this? Yeah, I can take us to Menti now. Okay. Okay. So this is the idea of motivators. So if you're thinking or just imagine a grade nine student, who uh, wants to continue in taking FSL when it's no longer mandatory, what do you feel is their main motivator, would be their main motivator? In your experience, again, it doesn't have to be linked to research if you've read the article or anything like that. Wow, there's a lot of us in the chat. Well, yeah. So just to get a sense of what you feel um, is the main motivator. Tina, how am I doing for time, by the way? I'm not even paying attention. Um, you have about 10 minutes, but I think most people here are flexible, so if you need a little bit of extra time, no worries. interesting way to do it. I feel like I'm <laughs> <all> tripped out. <laughs> it doesn't really say what Claude wanted. It's creating a word. Wanted to yeah, force, yeah. Okay. force people into thinking about the main motivator. <laughs> I know. I thought it like, okay, I'm just going to like, I can't look at it. Well, it's good. <laughs> this is excellent. I like this website. You tell me if we're, oh, there's seven, oh, I see the number on the bottom. Jobs are a big one. Mm -hmm. Travel is a big one. <clears throat> I find it interesting they want to teach FSL. That's definitely uh, something that they're, I think the government just put out, or CPF just put something out. Or no, it's actually put something else uh, out for students to, actually is l'Association Canadienne de Professionnelle en Immersion, quelque chose comme ça. Um, they put out uh, something for to encourage students to pursue a career in uh, immersion students to pursue a career in FSL and uh, or career opportunities, I guess, not just in FSL teaching, but career opportunities. That's very interesting. 
Okay. For 22. Thank you, GPA. Okay. So do we want to sensing jobs, travel, job or jobs if we combine those? Um, it looks like job opportunities as well, potential employment, they all sort of flow together. Do I need to share my screen again? Uh, yes. <laughs> okay, but do you have to stop now. doing yours or how does that No, work? No, you just share your screen and I'll just uh, okay. force mine to stop. <laughs> you want to continue. Okay, so share. Okay, so I mean, I'll briefly, um, motivators are very in line with what the research has shown, enhanced job opportunities. Engagement, previous success in French class is actually quite a motivator as well. Um, many of the studies on the screen have uh, demonstrated that at the, these are mostly that are related to core French, I should have mentioned as well. Even though the prompt is related to episode generally. Confidence gains from French class, uh, again, linked to French class as a potential motivator. Um, prospects, not only for jobs, but enhanced post secondary is a few. Importance according to French and English, and then the desire, that one is a whole other conversation the desire to maintain friends to assist new Francophone immigrants. I always put that, it's one study, it was a small study, a student of mine interviewed um, two grade, three grade nine students in, um, who were newcomers to Canada and wanted to know what their motivation was to continue um, studying French when it was no longer mandatory. And they were very emphatically dedicated to the idea of helping newcomers who may speak French slightly better than they speak English and wanting them to adapt um, and help them to integrate better into uh, into society. So I thought that was quite interesting. So it looks like your experiences and your um, sort of um, your feelings about that are in line with the research. So let's talk about demotivators. So what do you feel is the main demotivator for students wanting to discontinue learning in episode two? So I think I'll let hands off. I'll let her go. Tina, you're a rock star. Oh my God. <laughs> Maybe this one has stumped people. Oh, she's putting in the comment. Oh Peer pressure is a big one. I would say in my experience, having talked to people who have dropped out for sure. I'm seeing great grades is uh, the central one. So I would, uh, I, I'm certain, as I said, I've spoken to many people, many students that I've spoken to, um, not in terms of research, but just anecdotally do talk about the fear of um, uh, if they're not doing well in French and their grades aren't good in French, then obviously they're going to drop it a dropout. Whereas I saw in the previous one, there were a few people that said that if you're doing well in French, then it might, you might be more inclined to continue on because it's an easy grade. Um, in fact, so here I go, um, and it might not be, obviously wouldn't be a surprise to people who um, read the article and the existing research, that it really is linked to their um, perceptions of their competence, but also their, and their beliefs and their experiences in um, a French classroom, uh, which they link to the language. So we have perceived lack of oral proficiency, French is too difficult, um, boring risk of bad grade in French class, which is definitely part of it. No room in the timetable for French. French is not perceived as important or useful um, and no role for French in the future. So these pieces um, I find most interesting when mapped with the motivators that if one were to, if I go back, 
Engagement, previous success in French class and confidence gained from French class can be a motivator. And it can also be that the flip side is it can also be a demotivator. But the negative attitudes and the negative attitudes towards your own perceived competence and your um, attitudes towards the experience of learning French is definitely pivotal and seems to be more pivotal, pivotal maybe, maybe, um, in, the, uh, in the demotivating side of things. So for me, when I looked at this literature in more detail, wanting to dive into the grade nine core French experience, it became, I could see indications of this dynamic nature of factors. So if jobs are prevalent and they're a motivator, can they out motivate the demotivating factors? And how do they interrelate? Like what, how do we address all of this? Um, there's certainly simple ways in my mind that I suggest in the article to do that. But what I wanted to do is dive into some of the data to co-analyze it so you can see it from the student voices themselves. So, I mean, this is a, a quick slide. Um, if you wanna know more about the study itself and what was done, um, you can definitely take a look at it if you didn't read it for the class, if you're from outside of um, the, uh, the course itself. But what is most useful, I think, in this vein is that um, survey that asked participants to indicate their intent to continue discontinue studying French next year. So they were grade nine core French students in Ontario and explain the reason for their choice. And then the focus group focused a little bit more intently on their experience learning French to date, desire to learn it in the future and their opinions about French being an obligatory subject of study. So this was ones who wanted to continue and discontinue um, together in focus groups. So this is just a test run to give you a sense of what we're looking to do. So I don't mind if you pop your microphone on or raise your hand, or I don't know, we can do that at this point, but I'm gonna show you a couple of citations from um, the interviews. So to give a sense of what I'm wanting to, to dive into. So this is from Carmen and those who start with a C are ones who have indicated that they are going to be continuing in grade 10. And uh, those with a D is just, are discontinued. So, this is one from Carmen who says, I'm not a strong student in French, but I know that learning French and being able to speak another language will help me in my future. So I guess the first prompt is this student might be motivated by what? One might, I guess I could do a think a lot on this and then I'll go to the next one for time. So one would look at the quote and say, okay, this student seems motivated by, um, uh, it's gonna help them in their future prospects as we were talking before. And then conversely, the student seems motivated, demotivated by the fact that they're not necessarily too strong. So there's a demotivating factor there in terms of getting engagement, but they're still gonna, they're still gonna hash it out. So there's these, there are these competing, competing factors that contribute to their decision, but one usually outweighs the other. Um, and again, this idea of this, this ought to kind of piece coming into, I know that learning French and being able to speak it will help me in my future. I've heard it enough. It's been presented to me enough so that I've, you know, I've sort of bought in. So it's kind of those prompts that we're going to go to in a second with the second set. So, uh, Shakina, do you want to be Courtney? Oh yeah, sure. This. Antoinette Gagne showed me this. <laughs> you can, it's brilliant. It's brilliant for we're role quotes. playing. <laughs> okay, it's sure. Role playing, baby. That's right. Oh, okay. well, I'll be Courtney. Be Courtney. Yeah, I'm French. Denise. Sure. French. <laughs> French would help to get a job. For me, I want to get several different jobs. But I know if I want to be a vet veterinarian, you have to know French because your clients won't be all English. I was told a lot growing up that in order to get a job here in Canada, you need to know French. As I've grown up, I hear a lot of people saying, oh, you need French. And French is a benefit, but it's not mandatory. And it kind of makes me feel really bad because I really, really struggle with French. And then you say, oh, you need it. And I'm like, oh, no, you don't. This is grade nine. This is exactly what it's talking. So what can I say? It's a benefit, but there's a lot of... Like you're not always going to need it. Yeah, the thing is, is that in Canada, you can't get a job if you don't know English. English is spoken everywhere, and if you have a job, pretty much you have to speak English. So as long as I know English, I'm good. So the prompts, and I don't know if you can do that, maybe we do it in the chat, just to keep it easier that way. Yeah, I think chat would be easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so essentially, maybe talk about in the chat, or write down your thoughts on motivating and demotivating factors that you see creeping up in this discussion, because this was part of a focus group. Again, grade nine students being asked um, why they discontinued or continued, uh, why they made that selection that they did. So I'll let you go in the chat and sort of give your impressions of that. Um, again, going back to that, I can't see the chat. I cannot see the chat. Can I do that? I can't see the chat if I'm sharing. Oh, there it is. Um, there we go. Motivating job opportunities that are future. Yep. Yeah, I agree. 
I, I, I guess I don't think it's sad. You'll see in a minute. I don't think it's sad. I think it just has to be nuanced a little bit. Yeah, that's awesome. Yep. Absolutely. You'll see that Leia in the next one for sure is, is pretty prevalent. Denise really, oh, look at that. It's using the, it's using the I went forward. Right. Okay. So I'm seeing a lot of, uh, and again, this is not right or wrong. It's just what jumps out at you. Um, it matches the existing research in the sense of job opportunities really um, being a motivating factor, connection with potential clients and whatever job you might be working in. Um, I don't know about you, but personally, I didn't know exactly. I think I wanted to be a journalist when I was in grade nine, and I'm not a journalist. So I mean, things change, your vision changes, your employment desires change. Um, this obligation to learn French, that, that you need French. As I've grown up, I hear a lot of people say, oh, you need French. And I find that really interesting. To me, from a um, from an adolescent perspective, they don't like to be told what you need, or they hear it and they're like, yeah, 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 whatever. So to me, I think that engaging with them on where they're at is a huge uh, is a huge piece that could be taken advantage of a little bit more in core French in particular. Of course, the demotivation they are struggling with French. Um, I think there was saying they didn't get by grades, or that's the other one. Potentially limited time frame for the usefulness. Not sure they're whether they're going to need it or use it. And you're not always going to need it. That's kind of a, an interesting one. Um, let's go to similarly, a societal model. Oh, God, the chat is so interesting. I don't know what to do with myself. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, Ashley, keep that in mind. Holy smokes. See if that, if you see that in this one. All right, here we go. Data set three, same thing. I'll be Denise. You can be Charlotte. How about sure. that? You ready? Okay. So this is our good old friend Denise. She had a, a lot of doozy uh, quotes. I have decided to drop French entirely. I don't want to do core and I don't want to do immersion. I want 100% English, English, English. One is just that it's bringing my overall average down. Talked about that before. Two, I've flip flopped back and forth between core and immersion. So I have a good idea of what it's like in both areas. Something I found is that immersion teachers on average are more motivated. They're better teachers. The teacher I have right now is probably the best teacher I have ever had because he speaks French, but all the core teachers I've had would say something in English and they'd say it in French and then you listen to the English and you tune at the French. Yeah. I showed that quote just as a sidebar, <laughs> just to, hold on. I show that quote to my students who say, well, you know, what are we supposed to do when we talk in French? And they just look at you with these eyes. Like, I, I, don't, I don't understand. I'm sure it happens in all language classes, right? And it's that, that that's, they're just waiting for the translation if you constantly, Translate, translate, translate. That's what they do. So go ahead, Charlotte. <laughs> yeah. So you don't get the point. You understand what you'll you'll keep it in your head. Like I prefer my old teacher. She refused to speak English even if you were in core. She would only speak French, and you had to figure out what she said. So you had to pick up the idea yourself. I feel like this is the best tactic, but it was like above our level. I think if you understand it, she's a great teacher. But if you don't understand it, you're left in the dust. And I was one of the kids who was left in the dust. So I don't think that's uncommon to a lot of learners, particularly in core French, unfortunately. Um, but the role of the teacher in here is just, you know, blown up. And you can put your thoughts in the chat for sure. I just want to make sure that I have enough time for uh, Q&A at the end to not mess around with keeping this timing too much. But, um, you know, things that come out of that for me are motivation and the capability of the teacher. Right now is probably the best teacher I've ever had because she speaks French. Some may think, and I've had student teachers in my classes think that, you know, connecting with the students is number one. But again, if you aren't giving them not only the environment in which to take risks with the language, but the modeling that they require if they're leaving the class and not getting any French, it's a, it's a very uh, difficult role to play. And I think one that not a lot of other teachers have to play, but uh, French teachers are very kind of specialized in that way. Challenge of figuring out French. And then the other demotivating factors are bringing the average down, which we talked about. Expectations of immersion in core and translation into English, not speaking French all the time is definitely a, a demotivating factor. So 
everybody, if you're ever doing a conference presentation, should have a slide like the following. It's your go-to slide if you're out of time. So I'm actually at it, which is a dream. And this is my at it, my go-to main points to take away. So for me, the main points to take away, I have that book there that I'll talk about in a minute. Main points to take away from the previous slides that we've looked at in terms of motivation are that Motivate to Learn FSL is not as clear cut as we may think it is. And it's important to kind of listen to, I started listening to um, approaches and tactics from the field to try and motivate students to continue in French or even to motivate teachers to come to the field. And it's very, very intriguing to me that they're, they're doing this from a perspective of not really asking teachers, you know, why did they want to become a French teacher? Or that's, that's only part of the discussion. Um, a lot of it comes at it from, you know, there's jobs in politics, there's jobs in or the, the civil service and so on. Um, but jobs may be a motivator, but it's more complicated than that. That's what this data sort of says to me. Is it a real motivator for continuing in school, which is if we're talking about that in particular? And do motivators have the potential to cancel out the motivators? In this case, I don't think they do because they're not only drastically different, but I think that um, I don't think that we have, and the other data that I didn't present in that article is the, the looking at it from the theoretical perspective of um, ideal second language selves, that the core French students don't have a clear sense of who their ideal second language self is. They don't really think that much about French into their future and how it links too much beyond grades and post-secondary. The other striking thing to me, which really led me to um, these particular pieces that I'm looking at now is that none of, when they're asked in the focus group if their teacher had ever talked to them about what motivates them to take French, not a, every single one of them said, I've never been asked that question. Now, they're grade nine, so they might not remember, but it was pretty, you know, not surprising to me, but I thought, why aren't we asking them this question? Why aren't we engaging them in activities that are, that are, their whole point is to access their motivation. And I found that in the ESL, EFL literature, and this book that's on the screen right now is one, that actually does that. It taps into their motivation to learn English, to be an English speaker. And in my opinion, the activities that are in this book would be really interesting, and I'm, that's the kind of work I'm doing right now, to uh, engage in discussion with students as young as in grade four to get a sense of what's motivating them to learn French. What do they like about French? Um, what do they think about their future French self, whether that be into the long-term future or really just you know next year? Um, one of the things about the action-oriented approach is this idea that languages yearn to learn to, or languages use to perform social acts. So what social acts are grade four students doing right now in the languages they know? And if we show students doing that in French, could that be a motivating factor for them? If they have a grandparent who, have, who has Alzheimer's and they hear that a benefit from learning another language is to stunt the development of you know, Alzheimer's, which there's a lot of fantastic research that does show that, then maybe that's a motivating factor. And I mean, we never know what's gonna motivate students at a particular given time. So to me, I wanna begin by examining profiles of, in this case, it's second language learners in English, but I've been trying to kind of work with the profiles that are in um, this particular book and see if we can do the same thing with FSL and not necessarily publish a book, but pilot some of the, the pieces with students and teachers and see what they think. The other piece is that I like this publication that was uh, put out by Castalt a few years back of the, it's a literature review on the impact of second language learning. You'll see that Castalt has actually reoriented and has a big promotional campaign of languages lear or learning languages, like it, they do this and they talk about all the benefits individually that are research-based. And so to me, um, this idea, and again, it goes back to that focus group thing where nobody was asking them. So future efforts to motivate students need to respond concretely to what demotivates them and connect more relevantly to what motivates them. So it's not just a matter of, um, you know, if jobs motivate them, then let's talk about jobs. It's actually looking at the pieces that are demotivating at the same time and responding concretely to those. And then in that motivating piece, as jobs and job and job opportunities were like huge in that world, they're huge for students too. They're hearing it, but I think that there would be usefulness and I'm working with some uh, colleagues at Statistics Canada to start nuancing that idea of employment opportunities. What does that mean? Does it mean I have to get a specific job? Does it mean that I just have to, you know, learn French and the fact that I'm bilingual is considered an asset? Uh, even if I don't use French, that's one of the things we're starting to look at is that, you know, to what extent does, um, in the census data anyway, demonstrate that knowing French and having a working knowledge of French will get you a better paying job, but it, the better paying job is not necessarily, you're not ever going to use it. So, I mean, that to me is that nuance that we're trying to kind of get at because I feel like it would speak to students 
uh, younger students if that's the kind of motivator that we're going to be um, that is basically emphasized. So that's all I have. I have this pretty slide that is final. Shakina, uh, Shakina Selena will recognize the nice uh, logo because I think it was hers used in another uh, slideshow. I love to talk. I'm a nerd. Contact me anytime. Thank you, Shakina. Thank you. Um, by email, I'm on Twitter. Um, again, go to the Edukline website or the cohort website if you want to see what we're up to at the University of Ottawa. But I'm really, really intrigued to know what you think about this topic, about FSL generally and, and uh, other aspects of your engagement with uh, policy and reality. So thank you very much for having me. This has been a real trip. I've gone over time by enough. So yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And my daughter didn't come in. She didn't. <laughs> Hopefully she's enjoying the pizza and the movie.